Good evening. Man, y'all have gotten so good at that. It's almost like we practice every week or something. It's great to have everybody with us tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about God's response to unrighteousness. Now, coincidentally, there's, there's multiple responses that God has to unrighteousness. And some overlap in some ways. Some are very similar in some ways. And some are different uh, in quite a few ways. We're going to talk about some of those concepts tonight. But I think it's very important for us to understand that our response to unrighteousness should be very similar, not exactly the same as God's, but should be very similar to that of the way that God responds to unrighteousness. And the reason why I say it should not be the exact same is because we're in different positions. God finds himself in a position of of authority. God finds himself in a position of power, a position that we are not, uh, that we do not hold, and on top of that, that we should never hold, nor place ourselves or seek to place ourselves within his position. And so his response is going to be slightly different uh, to the way ours is. However, there are quite a few similarities. And and the first thing I want us to talk about is all the way back in the garden. This is the first instance where we see unrighteousness taking place, that which is outside of the will of God, uh, the opposite, if you will, of righteousness. Um, it is something that is existing with outside of the realms of God's will. God's intention for man was for man to exist in harmony with God and to be together for eternity. That is still his, his goal. That's part of the reason why he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins is so that we could be with him for eternity. And yet because of the unrighteousness that takes place in the garden, we see very quickly that God has to respond in a certain way. So let's look together at, uh, at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 16 through 24. This is immediately following the sin uh, that Adam and Eve have, have, have had uh, after taking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, um, there's a few things that are, that are very important for us to uh, talk about um, and, and it, kind of tricky at times uh, with the wording in Genesis 3. But we're going to do our best to to make sure that we get the understanding. Let's start in verse 16 together of Genesis chapter 3. After he has given uh, the punishment um, to... uh, After he's he's discussed some of the evil and wickedness that has taken place, he turns to the woman and he says, verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Uh, In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said... Because you have heeded to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat the bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. From dust you are, and from dust you shall return." And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden uh, of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to uh, to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here in Genesis chapter 3. There's a few things I would like to mention uh, first. The first of which being uh, the very first thing that God does uh, after handing out these specific punishments to both Adam and Eve, beginning with Eve and then moving on to Adam, is he separates them from his presence. He removes them out of the garden. And because of this, or or, or the reason behind this, at least from what we can see throughout Scripture, uh, that might give indication to the specific purpose of this, is is seemingly because of uh, of their unrighteousness. Their imperfection now has not allowed for them to be within the presence of God. Uh, Because of sin entering into this world, because of sin specifically entering into their lives, they cannot be in the presence of the Lord. And so the Lord removes them. But before he he removes them completely, he gives out some specific instructions or some specific uh, punishments, if you will. To Eve, he tells her that that, uh, two main things, the first of which is uh, that childbearing is going to become a lot more difficult uh, for her. 
then it's going to bring a, lot of, a great deal of pain. It's going to bring a, a great deal of suffering. And included within that also is the submission unto the husband. Uh, is the second of these of these things that is handed down. So it seems as if, uh, at least in the, in the pre sin garden, before sin had ever entered in, uh, that that Adam and Eve were equal. And it seems also that Adam uh, that uh, Eve would not have experienced pain and suffering during the uh, reproductive uh, uh, aspect of things, giving uh, giving birth, this that, and the other. And so y- you've got these two main things that are passed down. You're going to have a great deal of, of pain and suffering uh, when you're delivering a child. Included within that, you will submit unto your husband. Now, for the husband, uh, for Adam, the, the uh, command is very simple as well. The punishment is very simple as well. You're going to have to work very hard to get anything from the ground. And it's kind of twofold as well. Because in the same, say, in the same sense that Eve receives a twofold punishment, so also does Adam receive a twofold punishment. Because you'll notice that he is to till the ground, but he, he doesn't just call it the ground. He says the ground from which you came. And then he follows that up by mentioning that you will return one day into that ground. So it's not just the, the uh, for Eve, it's not just the uh, tough uh, delivering of children. It's not just the submission unto the man. It's also now for Adam, the tilling of the ground, the hardships that will be experienced in, in reproducing uh, or producing some food or some crops for you. And the second unto that is that, that one day you're going to die that one day you will return to the dust from which you came. And and then there's a very unique and strange moment here where God then kills an animal and makes a tunic, if you will, or clothes for both Adam and Eve. Now, there's a few interesting things about that because of the first of which we we now see this seemingly is the first sacrifice. Uh, This was not necessary uh, in, 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 in the garden before the sin of Adam and Eve. This was not necessary before Eve had, had partaken of that fruit, and then, before, and then after that, Adam took of the fruit. This only became necessary after sin had entered into this world. And so what's the response of God? Well, the first thing is to give them individual punishments, not just them, but also to the serpent, as well as providing a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. But then after those individual punishments are given, then there's a sacrifice that is made for the benefit of both Adam and Eve. They were naked in the eyes of the Lord, naked in the eyes of themselves, and so God kills an animal, and provides a tunic for them. But then we get to verse 22. And verse 22 is, is where things get a little tricky and interesting. Because, it, you know, oftentimes, at least when I was a kid, when I was growing up, when I would think about the, the, the Garden of Eden, I'd think about all these beautiful, magnificent trees, all this abundance. But when I thought about the trees of, of great importance, typically my mind would only focus on one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But there's two trees that are mentioned here. Um, separated from just the normal fruit-bearing trees. Notice in verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has, come, uh, has become like one of us, to know both good and evil, which was, of course, the intention of that tree. It gave them the opportunity to partake of that tree, and partaking of that tr- the tree of the knowledge of good and evil gave them the knowledge of good and evil. But he says, And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden and to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out man. He placed a cherubim at the east uh, of the Garden of Eden where the flaming sword had turned every way to guard, notice this, guard the way to the tree of life. The two significant trees that are mentioned here are two totally separate trees, seemingly. You've got this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and this tree of life. Because of their partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they have separated themselves from the tree of life. Interestingly enough, thousands of years later, when Jesus comes to this earth, he begins to teach certain things. And what does, he th- and what does he say within his teachings? He says things like, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Of course, we can also look at the many other concepts of, of trees throughout Scripture and looking at Jesus dying upon the cross, uh, the, the, the tree of life, which is in, um, in heaven for eternity, in the, in the dwelling place of the Lord, which gives forth eternal life. And so it, it, they said, okay, you've already partaken of this tree of knowledge of good and evil which is wrong, which is unrighteous, it's outside of the will of God. And your punishment for such is not just a removal from the presence of the Godhead, from the garden. The punishment is not just the the pain within childbearing, the submission to the husband, the the death of man, the tilling of the ground. The punishment is also the removal of the ability to partake of the tree of life, which seemingly is the thing that gives life eternally. And I say seemingly not because... 
I, I don't know that it is. I know that this is the tree that gives forth eternal life. That's, that's part of what uh, is mentioned here in verse 22. But the response of God is very simple here. It is to remove man, not just from his presence, but to remove man from the thing that gives eternal life. Now this concept does not stop within, uh, within Genesis chapter 3. This concept carries on throughout the rest of the Bible. Now, it's seen in different ways and described in different ways. But the two main principles, they're removed from his presence. They're removed from the thing that gives eternal life. Stand tall even unto day within our experiences with sin. When we encounter sin, when we do things that are outside of the will of God, when we have practices that are in line with unrighteousness rather than in line with righteousness, we remove ourselves further from the presence of God. And remove from ourselves the ability to live forever. The ability to have eternal life. And so we see this throughout Scripture. Like I mentioned, we see it in places like Romans chapter 1. And I'd encourage you to flip to Romans chapter 1. We're going to have a little bit of a lengthy read in in Romans 1. Um, But it gives a really good indication of separation between God and man. God who is perfect and eternal and all-knowing. And, and is described in places like uh, the book of John as, as being this light which darkness can, cannot comprehend, this darkness cannot coexist with this light. It, it, by, God by nature cannot be in the presence of one who has surrounded themselves with unrighteousness. What do I mean by that? Not that he's not all present, not that he's not all knowing, not that he's not all powerful, but this light cannot be in the presence of darkness, because darkness cannot exist in the presence of this true light. So let's notice in Romans chapter 1 together, verse 18 and following. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because because what uh, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile within their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to their vile passions, for even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burning their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. When we were studying the book of Romans together in our ladies' class on Wednesdays, when we got to this passage, I pointed out one specific phrase that is very troublesome, and it's that phrase that is found in verse 32. Knowing the righteous judgment of God. What does that mean to know the righteous judgment of God? Knowing that God will judge the righteousness or unrighteousness of every man on the day of judgment. Knowing that they will stand before the Creator and answer for these things. Those who practice and, and know that in that judgment, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. All these horrible, evil, wicked things, this this lying, unforgiving, uh, backbiting, sexually immoral people. All these evil and wicked things that are done are deserving of death. Knowing these things, not only do these, but also approve of those who practice them. Now this is not just a, a, I have become desensitized to evil and wickedness. That, well, I, I see it and I experience it and you know, that's what, how it goes, it's what happens, that's man. 
No, it's not just a recognizing of something that evil has done and being kind of okay with it. This is enticing of it, encouraging it, knowing that they will stand before God and answer for their unrighteousness. They practice such things in a way that is boastful in the eyes of the Lord. How evil and wicked of a description given in verse 32. Knowing that those who do these things will face the wrath of God, will face death and destruction, not only do them themselves, but approve, encourage others to do so as well. Yet at times, if we're not careful, we find ourselves in the same position. Yet at times, if we're not careful, we find ourselves to be untrustworthy or unloving or unforgiving or unmerciful or any of the uh, 20 other things that are mentioned here is sinful. We know that we're going to face a God who judges us for these things. We know that we're going to stand before God and answer for these things. We know that those who do such things are worthy of death, and yet what do we do? We practice these things. We become desensitized to these things, and we even encourage these things in other people. How wrong, how evil, how wicked, how shameful of us to ever grow desensitized to sin. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21 uh, talking about the, the walking within the, the Spirit or walking after the flesh. I say then, verse 16, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, uh, for the, flesh, flesh, excuse me, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I have told you beforehand, just as I have told you in times past, that those who practice such things, notice this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice such things, we see in Romans chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 5, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning what? You will not be within His presence and you will not have eternal life. Each of these things are seen throughout Scripture. We see this in places like Mark chapter 7, verse 20 and 23. And he said, what comes out of man, excuse me, and he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within that defile a man. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But, but, no, uh, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, notice this, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Why would a warning be given to turn away from such people because Timoth uh, Timothy's writings have an understanding not just within Timothy's writings but also throughout the New Testament gives us a very clear understanding that God separates himself from people who practice unrighteousness. As was read for us, uh, I find it really hard to say by Randy, by granddaddy, sorry, he's my granddaddy. As was read for us by, by granddaddy in Revelation 21 and verse 8, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Looking at all these descriptions throughout the New Testament gives us a very clear image of how God deals with unrighteousness. He separates himself from unrighteousness and those who practice unrighteousness. Meaning what? That upon the day of judgment, we will not be able to enter into his presence, and we will not be able to inherit eternal life if we are found to be ones who practice or do the deeds of unrighteousness. But, here's where things get a little interesting. While his response to unrighteousness has been consistently, from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, throughout the, even throughout the New Testament, with this separation throughout, you'll even notice... Um, Something I didn't for time's sake put in here, but something that I, I debated putting in here was looking even within the, the, the people of Israel and their dealings and their travels with God. You'll notice the people who did not inherit uh, the, the promised land were those who practiced unrighteous deeds, who did not put their trust in the Lord. And so what was the case? They, they wandered for 40 years aimlessly, 
with, uh, seemingly without the presence of the Lord, and then included within that, they were not inheritors of that resting place, uh, a foreshadowing or a type of judgment of those who practice unrighteousness. They're removed from His presence, and they are not able to inherit eternal life or that, that place of rest for the Israelites. So it carries not just from the beginning of time, not just through the time of the Israelites, even into the New Testament within the, within the church and its teachings. Those who practice unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not be within His presence. They will not receive eternal life. But here's where things get very interesting, like I mentioned. There's also this other response from God. It's not just a separation from, from God and, and unrighteousness. It's not that he just, just quits some cold turkey and gives up on them. The interesting thing about God is while he, yes, is, is, finds himself separated from unrighteousness and yet removes people who were unrighteous away from him, he still does works or deeds seeking to reunite them with him. From the very beginning of of uh, sin entering into this world, like we mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, I mentioned the, the messianic prophecies. From the very beginning of the first sin that entered into the world, the, the, the plan of redemption was put into place. This, this uh, son of, of man that would crush the serpent's head after the serpent had bitten his heel. This significance showing the, the coming of the Messiah who seems as if the devil becomes victorious over him when he kills him. And yet because of this resurrection from the dead, the overcoming of this death, we have a hope of redemption. We have the opportunity for eternal life. We have the opportunity not just to have eternal life, but to be in the presence of the Lord again. So from the very entrance of sin into this world, it has been God, God's intention not just to separate himself from, the, from those who practice unrighteousness, but to give them the opportunity to be reunited with him again. That's where things become a little bit interesting. You look at passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-12, through 12, and you see God's desire is for us to, to be together with Him. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, writes about some of these evil and wicked things that we saw mentioned in, in places um, like Romans 1 or Galatians 5 or, and, and stuff like that, 2 Timothy 3. But, but here, the, the list is different. Because at the end of this list, it's not just, a, and these will enter into uh, eternal damnation. Or these will be separated from the Father for eternity. Or these will, inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Or these will be brought forth to the second death. Instead, we see this other ending to a list of sinful deeds. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9-12 through 12 says, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous, notice this, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Included within that is they will not be in His presence. And they will not have eternal life. But do not be deceived. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying within this phrase. Those who are fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. But this is where things get a little different. He doesn't stop with just that phrase. Because in verse 11 he says, And such were some of you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice this group that is mentioned in verses 9 and 10. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not enter into His presence any longer, and they will not have eternal life. But this group can come unto the Father. This group can find themselves separated from these acts of unrighteousness. And what is said about this group? You were like these people. You did these works of unrighteousness. You did all these evil and wicked deeds. But you were washed, you were sanctified, set apart, and you were justified as if you had never sinned in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How does God respond to unrighteousness? He removes people who practice unrighteousness from His presence and from the ability to, to come unto Him for eternity. But he also gives them the opportunity to come back because of the sacrifice of his son. You look at passages like Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, which, which says in a very similar manner the same thing. If you then were raised with Christ, this is not necessarily a listing of the unrighteous acts and then saying, okay, that was you, but now you're different. This is saying, as those who were raised with Christ... As those who were separated from those unrighteous acts. Notice what it said in verse 1. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, where He is sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. For you died, 
and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Notice this, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in these things. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouths. Do not lie one to another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where, uh, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian nor Scythian, slave nor free, uh, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The, the, the focus here in Colossians chapter 3 to the church at Colossae is uh, very similar to that of what we saw in 1 Corinthians 6. You were like that, but it goes beyond that. It says not just that you remove these evil and wicked deeds from your life, but you put them to death and continue in them no longer. It's not just that you regret the things that you have done, but that you live in such a way that you never partake of these things again. Notice there's two descriptions given in death here. The the call is for those who have been raised with Christ. It's those who have put to death uh, the old man of sin. And included within that is not just putting to death that old man of sin, but also putting to death the sinful deeds. When we think about death, uh, we don't typically think of death as a temporary thing, at least not in the sense of, uh, of, of them coming back to life on this earth. No, it, death is, is, is a necessary thing for each of us. Uh, it's actually, uh, honestly, it's, it's the purpose of our lives. It's so that we die one day and can go and be with the, with the Father for eternity and experience all these wonderful blessings. However, we don't typically think of, well, so-and-so died, but we'll see him again on Tuesday. No, it's, it's, a, it's a, a finite thing. It is something that is, is done. It's a done deal. And, and in the same way we look at these, these sins that are mentioned in Colossians chapter 3, he says, put these things to death. This isn't just that they're put to death on Sunday, but then Tuesday they show back up. It's not just that you put these to death when, whenever I'm baptized, and then maybe later, a, a couple of years down the road, I, I, a couple of years down the road, I enter into these things again. No, these things are put to death. These things are no longer within our lives. And we look at these things and we go, okay, well, that's, that's easy for some of these idolatry, murder, uh, 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 fornication, adultery, extortion, uh, stealing, lying. But what about unloving? What about unforgiving? What about anger? Filthy language? These things are not as easy at times to put out of our minds. Things that are not as easy to separate ourselves from. It says, you as Christians, you as those who have been risen from this old man of sin to rise to walk in newness of life, these things should not be present within your life. So if they are, what does that tell you? Maybe I didn't truly put to death that old man of sin. If these things are still present, maybe I need to do some reconsidering of my life. If these things are still present, maybe there's something that needs to change in my life right now to truly put these things to death. Why? Because there is coming a day when you will stand before God, when each of us will stand before God and answer for the unrighteousness that we have done within our lives. We already know God's response to unrighteousness. He separates us from Him and separates us from eternal life. The last passage I want us to look at tonight is Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Notice together Romans 5, 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength, we've talked about this recently, but I want us to touch on a couple of things. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die, but yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet unrighteous, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through His death, the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That last word there in verse 11 is so, so very important. We have now received reconciliation. God has separated Himself from unrighteousness. 
God will always separate Himself from unrighteousness. Which means that if I am a practicer of unrighteousness, if I have given my heart over to unrighteousness, on the day of judgment when I stand before Him and answer for my acts, I will be separated from Him. Why? Because if I am consumed by unrighteousness, He will cast me out. I will not be able to enter into His presence and I will not have eternal life. But God gives us the hope and the opportunity while we are still here to be reconciled to Him through the blood of Jesus Christ. God gives us the hope of an eternal life through reconciliation given by that blood that Jesus shed upon the cross so that we could not be separated and so that we can inherit eternal life because of that wonderful sacrifice. It has been made abundantly clear, not just in one sermon collecting a bunch of verses throughout Scripture. It has been made abundantly clear throughout Scripture that God will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. Those who are righteous will inherit eternal life and be able to be in His presence for eternity. And those who practice unrighteousness, those who were given over with a heart of unrighteousness, will not inherit eternal life and will not be able to be within His presence for eternity. So my question to you tonight is, which are you? Are you one who practices unrighteousness? Or are you one that practices righteousness? If you are unrighteous, then there's a few things that you need to know. Maybe you're unrighteous because you have never been a partaker.